In this module, we'll be talking about some of the advanced features of Elastic MapReduce. First thing up, bootstrap actions. So what are bootstrap actions? Well, these are ways that you can adjust the configuration of the servers and the Hadoop uh, installation that you're using when you're running Elastic MapReduce. So normally when you're using EC2, you have the ability to take an existing AMI, an image, and customize it, and then use that when you're starting up for example, single server or even a cluster of servers for Hadoop. Well, here with Elastic MapReduce, you've got a fixed AMI to start with, as well as a fixed Hadoop configuration. And sometimes you need to change that. So the way you change it is with bootstrap actions. So what happens is your cluster gets set up, so the servers are there, they've got Hadoop installed on it, and then before your job actually runs, you have the ability to tell Elastic MapReduce that you have one or more of these bootstrap actions that you want to run to adjust your configuration. So bootstrap actions are loaded from S3, similar to how your job jar gets loaded from S3. And Elastic MapReduce comes with a number of built-in ones for configuring the daemons in Hadoop, like your job tracker, task tracker, name node, data node, um, as well as doing things like uh, you know, installing ganglia or adding a swap file, which is actually one that you almost always want to do if you're running uh, jobs that use a lot of memory. So how do you actually specify bootstrap actions? There's two ways to do it in general. One way is, as always, via the AWS console. So when you're in the process of specifying a job flow, you'll have an opportunity to say, yes, I want to include a bootstrap action. The other way is when you're running the command line, then you use the dash dash bootstrap dash action uh, argument, and you give it that path like we talked about on the previous slide to where the script lives in S3. And you can also pass it um, optional arguments. And you can do this multiple times. So you can have one or more bootstrap actions. Now, one of the most common bootstrap actions, besides the one I mentioned about actually allocating swap space for your jobs, is when you want to tweak the settings that you're using for your Hadoop job. In that case, there's two common approaches. One is uh, when you're using bootstrap action and you're, you want to give it a path to a, an XML file that contains either your overrides or additional configuration parameters. And in that case, then, you do things like minus C, and you give it a path to essentially your core-site.xml file. And this, everything that's in here gets overlaid onto the existing core-site.xml file, gets merged in, which means, of course, that everything that's in your core-site.xml file should be appropriate for that particular Hadoop configuration file. Same thing, you can do a minus H and then a path to something that contains HDFS settings or something that contains MapRed settings with a minus M parameter. There's another way you can do it where you're not actually providing XML files, but you're doing individual values. And in that case, then you can do a minus C, lowercase c. And in this case, then it's a key equals value for individual parameters. And the same thing using minus lowercase h for HDFS settings and lowercase m for MapReduce settings. So if, as uh, I mentioned, uh, or as the slide said earlier, you, what you want to do is you want to boot, bump up the io.sort.md value. So you've got a job where a lot of data is being spilled to disk in between map and reduce phase, then, and you want to crank that up because you know that your tasks aren't using a lot of memory versus what's actually available in the child JVMs. In that case, great, you could do the minus m io.sort.mb equals 600 megabytes. Now there's another thing that you can do uh, that's advanced, which is spot pricing. I think most people probably have heard about spot pricing. And what happens here is uh, it's a bidding system where you say, I'm willing to pay X amount, up to X amount per hour for servers. And there's a spot price for each class of server and actually each region uh, that is based on the demand and available capacity. And if your bid price is too low, then you won't get your servers. Or you might get your servers, and then if the spot price climbs above that bid price, that maximum amount, then your servers go away. Uh, but you only pay what the current spot price is. Right? Your bid is the maximum amount per hour that you're willing to pay, but you only pay what the current going rate is. Right? So a typical spot price winds up being about a third of the regular price. So for example, M1 dot large instances, the typical hourly cost, this is the EC2 cost, uh, is around 33 cents an hour, and the spot price winds up being 10 to 12 cents an hour, so roughly a third. Note that the extra amount that Elastic MapReduce adds on as a charge 
per hour to the EC2 cost is fixed, so that doesn't vary with the spot price. So what that means is sometimes, for example, if you get a great deal on spot price, the spot price is only a quarter of the regular price. Um, if you're bidding on very large instances, your elastic map reduced overhead could wind up being almost the same amount as what you're paying for the EC2 servers. That's rare, but it can happen. So how do you know what the spot prices are? Well, the AWS Management Console gives you the ability to see what the historic, meaning over the past week or months, few months, spot price has been for each instance type. So we're going to go take a look at that now. So here we are at the AWS Management Console. And to see the spot pricing, you can actually go to EC2, because spot prices are for EC2 instances. So it's not directly related to Elastic MapReduce. And over here on the left, you'll see spot requests. If I click on that, it shows me what spot requests I've got here. And now I can click on pricing history. Pricing history here is going to show me price, in this case, for a T1.micro instance. But let's take a look at M1 large. And it's over the past week across all zones. So here you can see that the spot price is a little bit tricky. You can see it's about 10 cents an hour, as I said. And the typical on-demand price is about 30 cents an hour. Now you can see right in here, uh, the spot price was spiking up to a buck fifty an hour. So in that case, it's five x over what the on-demand price is. So you might ask, well, why does the spot price go up to dollar fifty an hour if on-demand is only thirty cents an hour? Well, what happens is you'll get a bunch of users who bid way over what the on-demand price is because they figure, look, if my job runs for five hours and for a few minutes I'm paying a spiky higher price, that's great. And so you'll see them setting a price like a buck fifty an hour. And what happens then is the spot price will increase up to a level where enough of these spot price instances get flushed out if Amazon is running short of server capacity. So you'll see this kind of pattern very, com very often in spot pricing history where the spot price will suddenly spike up to this very high level and then drop back down. Right? And you can see in, there's these different regions here. Um, so this is only for US East, but there are these subregions here, 1A through 1E, and the spot pricing in each one, because each one has its own capacity, is different. Now if we go to, for example, uh, let's pick something like a C1 Extra Large. Now C1 Extra Large, you'll see more spikes, though the spikes don't wind up, so this is, the, I think, the on-demand price for it here winds up being around uh, 60 cents an hour, maybe. Um, you'll, you'll see the spikes don't go up um, as a percentage, nearly as high as with the M1 larges. So anyway, this gives you an idea here of, of spot pricing and how you have to take a look at historical levels to figure out, A, you know, what's the likelihood of your cluster like losing service because of spot pricing, um, and B, what would be a reasonable amount to bid to try and ensure that you've got instances available when you need them. So a bit more about spot pricing. When do you use it? Well, if you don't actually care about your cluster getting killed, then great. You can essentially use it for the entire cluster that typically you only use it for the slaves, so that your master is still around to tell you what happened when your slaves all get killed off. In that case, if you're doing that, if you're gambling on you know, losing your cluster of spot pricing spikes, then you're going to be wanting to checkpoint the data as you process it. So typically, you have smaller jobs that then wind up writing intermediate results to S3, which will persist if your cluster goes away. Now, if you can't have the cluster die, then what can you do? Well, Amazon has, uh, via Elastic MapReduce, this really cool functionality that lets you say, for your Hadoop cluster, I've got some servers that are only being used for tasks, right? which means um, it's OK if those go away, as long as the core slaves, the ones that um, have both storage and processing on them aren't spot price. Those are on demand because then those won't go away. So you won't actually lose your cluster. So we're going to go in that in a bit more detail. First, let's talk about how you actually set up to use spot pricing. So when you're configuring your job flow, you have an opportunity to say, you know, I want to use spot pricing here. And you can specify spot pricing for the master, though typically you wouldn't do that, uh, for the core servers the ones that have both storage and 
processing, which means they're running both a data node and a task tracker uh, daemons. Um, or you can do it just for uh, the task group. So in this case right here, what you're seeing is that I'm requesting spot pricing for core instances. So I'm saying I want 10 instances of M1 large, and I'm going to do spot pricing, and I'm going to pay up to a dollar an hour. Or if you're using the command line, you can specify a dash dash and bid dash price with the hourly rate. So I mentioned this task group, which is a third kind of group beyond master and core. So they're only running the task tracker daemon, no storage, which means if they go away for some reason, then any tasks that are being run on them will fail and get rerun, but you never lose any data. And that's the main issue with servers going away from your cluster due to spot pricing spikes, is if those servers are running data nodes, which means then on those servers and their local drives or ephemeral storage, they have blocks of data, those can disappear. Now, so the good thing is great, you can have a task group that is spot priced, and if it goes away, your cluster runs slower, but it doesn't fail as long as you've got enough storage capacity on those core instances to store all the data that you're generating and processing. Uh, now, Elastic MapReduce, if the spot pricing drops, will try and reinstantiate the servers that you had in your task group, which is also a nice attribute of it. There is some loss in efficiency because any tasks that are running on these task-only servers always have to read their data over the network from some other machine. Typically, Hadoop tries very hard to ensure that if a task is running on a server, the server it's running on has a local copy of the data so that you're minimizing the network traffic. So that's not going to be the case for these um, task-only servers. They're always going to have to read blocks of data from other servers. Um, now, the other reason why task group is great is for dynamic cluster sizing. And we'll talk about that um, after this next section here. So to set up a task group, again, be the name of this console, it's that third section here when you're creating a new job flow. Down at the bottom there, I can say, okay, I'm going to have 10 of these M1 larges, and now I'm, I'm requesting spot prices for these task uh, instance group servers up to a buck an hour versus the core instance groups I'm not going to use spot pricing for. Or if you're using command line client, then I can do a minus minus instance dash group task and that then uh, lets me say I'm setting up just a group that are these uh, running these task trackers. Now, the task group is also one of the best ways to dynamically resize your cluster. And this is something you can't do with the AWS console. You can only do it with command line client. But you can do a dash dash add dash instance dash group um, and then task or core. And you can specify like, okay, how many of what type and what bid do you want to do for that? Um, and so that's a way that I can alter the size of this task group, these, these servers that are only executing um, the actual jobs. They're not actually storing any of the data. Um, I can also increase the core group count, but I can't decrease it. Because if you decrease it, then what you're doing is getting rid of servers that have blocks of data stored on them so you can lose data. Uh, what's nice about this is it means that if you set this up properly, you're running your job, you realize, you know, my job needs to finish in the next hour, and it's not. Um, it's not going to run that fast, so I'll just increase the number of servers in the task group uh, to get it done faster. Or it's like, you know what, this job here is going to finish, you know, at one hour plus one minute, which means I'm going to pay for a, essentially a whole hour of cluster capacity that I'm not really using. So you could remove some servers from the task group. The job takes a little bit longer to run, but you're running it with fewer servers, so it costs less. So it's a great way to both ensure uh, completion of job time and also to help manage your cost.